say to the people at home, um, the same question things apply, but if you like to put um, questions in on the chat, I will see them and uh, ask you to raise your questions at the end. OK. Oh. My is on. Uh, somebody at the door. <laughs> <laughs> My is in in case it gets stuck outside, so if it rings, I apologise. Um, but that's just if they want to get into the building. Right, well, thank you very much for the, uh, th the last minute invitation. Um, <laughs> as I am a fellow of both the IMECI and the PWI, I am doubly pleased to be here. Um, so hopefully you will all find something interesting. I suspect a lot of you know a lot of this already, um, but maybe not all of it. Um, I'm Principal Infrastructure Engineer, Rail Safety and Sanders Board. That's my day job. Um, and what I'm going to use here is a presentation that I've also used in a similar form for the MSc at Birmingham University, where I also do some lecturing. So there may be a few folk who've come across some of this stuff at Birmingham as well. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Various different types of derailment on plane line. I'm not going to go into switches and crossings, that was just getting too complicated. Um, so flange climb, gauge spread, track twist, track buckle, dynamic response to track, some of the classic derailment mechanisms and what is actually happening. As people will know, I'm a mechanical engineer with a background in vehicle track wheel rail. So, flange climb derailment. Oh, it's going on by itself. I should stop it if it goes too fast. Um, the conditions that increase the risk. I don't know, that's fine. It's all right, I'm under control. Um, so, what is flange climb derailment? Um, it's where the flange, instead of sitting like it should do against the rail there, rides up, runs along the track top of the rail, and maybe, we'll see a video in a minute, goes off in the wrong place. What makes it happen? The conditions that increase the risk of a wheel climbing the rail are an angle of attack, so the vehicle isn't pointing in a straight line, it's pointing off to the side, so the wheel is wanting to climb up the, the rail rather than roll straight forward. Um, a large lateral flanging force, so something pushing it sideways, and we'll come to what some of those might be. The unloading of the wheel so that the Q force, the wheel load on that wheel is low, less force keeping it on, makes it easier for it to climb off. A shallow flange angle, so that's the angle delta in that diagram, that's the angle of the flange at the contact point. If that's really steep, it's hard to get up. If it's shallower, it's easier to get up. Um, and finally, a high coefficient of friction between the wheel and the rail, because in normal running, the wheel has to slide down the rail. If the coefficient of friction is low, the flange can slide down the rail. You think, imagine that wheel rolling forwards, the flange comes along, it has to go past the rail to get down to the bottom as the wheel goes round. So if the coefficient of friction is too high, the flange may stick and it will go up instead of drop down. So that's some of the things that increase the risk of flange climbing. So when do those arise? Tight curves at low speed is the classic flange climb derail because that meets most of those things. Why low speed? Because we still get the lateral force on a curve. You get the lateral force. It's not speed dependent. It's to do with getting around the curve. Um, but if you're going slow, around a canted curve, the vehicle's leaning in, there's less load on the outside, which is the one that's going to climb. You don't climb over the inside, you climb over the outside. There's less load on it because the vehicle's leaning in. And track twist is an extenuating factor. When you get track twists, so for example, the top of a runoff transition, there is inevitably a twist when you go from a plane curve with count back to the plane line without count. So transition, you get flange climb. And not to put all the emphasis on the infrastructure side, rolling stock faults, so poorly set up suspensions, uneven loading are all factors in flange climb derailment and therefore the, the derailment risk. So throughout these examples, I've got some animations, not on this one, that come from Network Rail. Thank you very much, Network Rail, for some of their very nice animations. And I've got quite a lot of pictures that come from RAIB, the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. And they let you use them as long as you credit them. So I'm giving RAIB due credit 
for all the nice pictures and diagrams that I'm using from their reports. And if you want to know any more about any of these incidents, have a look at their reports. They're really good um, and they give a lot of technical background for the non-expert of how these things work. So we've seen this before, but it's another way of looking at the same thing. So in that plane of contact picture over on the left, we've got the normal force. We've got coefficient of friction, commonly mu. So on the, the plane, the, the angle plane, we've got a potential force of mu n. If T, which is the force holding us down, is greater than mu n, we're fine. If T, which is the force holding us down, isn't enough, and mu n is higher, we're less fine. And there's a high risk of flange point. So that's why it relates to all of those things, the angle, um, the friction, and there's a nice picture on the on the left there of a wheel lifted up. It's off tread, tread of, the, uh, of the rail. It's not yet derailed. It might well drop back the right side, but it's not happy. So here's an example. Um, and some of you will be familiar with this. Um, it's the derailment at Audsall Lane Junction in Manchester. Back in 2013, I think the report is 2014, as it says at the bottom there. Um, yeah, January 2013, um, a freight train derailed on a tight curve just prior to Walter Lane Junction. It's a very impressive photo because after the flange climb derailment, it burst into flames. So the picture looks very impressive because of the fire, not particularly because it was a flange climb derailment. Um, but taking some text from the report, that, that is text from the report, and you can see that a number of the factors that I've talked about came out in there. So dry and clean state of the rail, high friction. There was lubrication on the, on the track. It wasn't mid-dealing with that issue. There was high friction. Um, the wheels on the locomotive that derailed had just been machined. So any residual lubrication that would have been on those wheels had been taken off by the machining and it wasn't part of the process to put any back again. So the rail was dry and clean, the wheel was dry and clean. Not a good start. Um, and the wheel had been returned to the correct profile and you can see that's in the picture at the bottom. The green is the worn profile um, that is typical on those, on those vehicles and you can see that the flange is steeper on the green one than it is on the blue, which is the design, or the red, which is what it was turned to, which is correctly the design. So the new wheel was at more risk of derailing than a worn wheel would have done, which is why the locomotive of the same type pulling the train with this loco in it didn't derail, but the loco that had just come off works did. Um, it was wide to gauge track, and it was round about 200 metre radius. Below 200 metre radius, because it was a passenger line, it would have needed a check row. According to the drawing, it was slightly more than 200 metre radius, so it didn't have a check row. On the ground, it was actually slightly less, which didn't help. Um, so what can we do about flange climb derailment? Um, count excess is actually not a good thing for any reason. Uh, over counting curves gives us a lot of problems collectively. Um, it doesn't improve ride, it doesn't improve comfort, it doesn't improve forces, and it doesn't improve derailment risk. So over counting curves is always a mistake. It's, it's ne never good. Um, and there are quite a lot of curves that are actually over counted because they're counted for a line speed that nothing actually does. <laughs> If some of the trains actually do do a higher line speed, you need the count to cope with it. If nothing actually does it, then yes, it may be the line speed in the book, but it's not really a sensible one to, to set the count on. Um, track twist, we'll come back to that. Um, friction maintenance regime, friction management, that's for both parties, the wheel and the rail, um, and particularly named new wheels, more at risk flange angle, higher friction, a lot of factors came in there. Um, so rolling stock maintains a standard, loaded correctly, and check rails are actually quite good at presenting disasters. They're a little bit more expensive to install and maintain, but 
that would have been more than recouped by not having that clear run. So check rails are not just a pain, they are actually quite useful. Um, right, that's flange climb. Something different, gauge spread. And I'm sure this is one of Network Rail's animations. Oh, it's a bit of a wide gauge. Bother. The wheel's fallen in. Now that is seriously wide gauge if it gets wide enough for the wheel to fall in. But that is what happens. Um, and gauge spread is the widening between the rails, which is large enough that the wheel set will actually get fall in. Um, it's most likely, again, not universally, as we'll see in a minute, um, to arise on a curve where you've got a serious lateral force pushing the pushing the rails apart. Um, there are usually warning signs, problems with fastenings, problems with sleepers. They're not always spotted and they're not always dealt with appropriately. Um, there have been a number of cases, not just in this country, I've seen them elsewhere, um, where people have been routinely replacing fastenings and spot replacing sleepers without actually addressing the root cause. Um, and eventually that fails and you might get the age spread. So if something's routinely going wrong at the same place, there's probably a reason for it. And it might be worth trying to work out what that might be. And gauge defects are one of the most common causes of, of derailments. So why does the gauge spread? And here's some more nice animation. So I'll have a bit of tea while they're doing that. <laughs> nothing to see on the surface. Mm -hmm. If you've got a timber sleeper, there is something to see on the surface. I've seen I've seen that out on the track, the little curled up bits where it's clear the chair has been moving. Something else you wouldn't see on the surface, but the rail has been moving and it's damaged the chair so it can actually spread. This is a classic. Um, the number of times you will read in an RAIB report the chair heads were complete, the screw, screw heads were completely loose. It looks fine from the surface, but those screws are doing absolutely nothing because they're broken. So there's no restraint on the rail moving when there's force. And a side-worn rail increases the apparent gauge and makes it more likely for the, for the wheel to, to fall in. Um, so the problems are below the sleeper surface and they're actually very difficult to see unless you watch it, um, which is why gauge measurements from um, on track, from the, the measuring trains or from other purposes are really important, but you won't see that on a, an unloaded static gauge measurement because the rails come back to their normal position. It's only the loaded gauge that actually tells you what's really happening. Um, so where does it most often occur? Um, there's another little animation over there showing you the sort of difference between static and dynamic, as they call it, gauge. It can be quite significant, the difference, as you'll see on a, on a later picture. Um, curves, again, um, unusual arrangements like longitudinal timbers on bridges where you might find tie bars between the, the timbers, but they may or may not do be doing their job very well. Um, they're difficult to manage gauge and they're difficult to spot. Um, switching crossing, you can get all sorts of odd lateral forces in switches and crossings, which don't help. Um, running on and off bridges where the, it goes from a stiff support to a soft support, that's also difficult to manage. Any of these locations are challenging. So dynamic loaded track gauge is the key to understanding this. The, these are the typical responses from the network rail standard. And as you can see, um, if it gets up to 1478, panic block the line. At that stage, the risk of, of derailment is so high that you do not want to be running anything. Um, and going down there, it depends on the speed, what the response time is at the various different levels. But right up the top, that's that's serious danger area. We really don't want to be there. Um, so it's important, it's monitored, but sometimes it fails. Um, and this is the example I picked from the RAIB reports which was, another, again, freight train, um, actually on longitudinal timbers um, on a bridge. And you can see the damage it did. Um, not pretty. Nobody was damaged. Um, nothing fell off into anybody's garden or anything like that. But the damage to the railway was quite significant. Um, 
the gauge was wide and it was measured, but there was no action. So if you look at those pictures at the bottom, the diagram, the, the, the graph, um, you can see the dynamic gauge measurements in blue and the static, I unloaded, gauge measurements in orange. That is a sizable difference between the two. Um, and the blue lines are all above the intervention limit. They've been above the intervention limit for quite some time, but it didn't get through to the folk who needed to do something about it. Um, and the, the condition of the bogey, it's a question that always gets asked, well, why was it that vehicle that came off, not one of the others? Why did it come off that day, not the day before? Um, the condition of the bogey increased the lateral forces and made that the one that actually broke the camel's back. Um, the bogey centre pivot wasn't quite as it should have been. It was a bit offset. So it was run, it's all in the in the RAID report. I see a few puzzled faces, but um, where the bogey rotates under the body, um, it's a cup and cone, a bit like that dish on the table with something sitting in it from the from the body. So it, it rotates underneath. Um, and it wasn't quite lined up so that it had worn in a funny way. And it was probably not rotating as freely as it might and producing higher than usual forces. Hadn't necessarily been through an inspection that would have spotted it. By itself might not have been a problem, combined with the lack of attention to the infrastructure was a problem. Um, and the wagons were also unevenly loaded, with the load biased towards one side rather than the other. Again, not a criticism of the guys doing the loading. It's actually very difficult to load those wagons um, and get it even. And we've put a lot of effort over the last five years or so into giving better guidance to freight operators in how to load wagons properly and how to tell that they're loaded. Um, so all sorts of things come together to make it happen. Um, so what can we do? It's fairly obvious. Um, ensure that the track gauge under load is measured and when it flags something that it's acted on. Um, and as my colleague who track engineer always says, record all fastening failures in the asset system. Just because you can put a new clip in or you can put a new bolt in or a new screw or a new whatever doesn't mean the problem's gone away. If the old one broke, it broke for a reason. So flag it and then the trends are easier to see and it's more likely to get fixed before it becomes a big problem. Um, and be aware of what the high risk sites are, which are the ones that I've gone for. Um, right, so that's gauge spread. Moving on, track twist. These all sound like disasters, don't they? But it's uh, it's useful education. But um, so this is a wheel unloading on track twist. <coughs> wheel flange gets high enough. Oh, off it goes. We've got a derailment. Um, so it's a bit like flange climb, but it's particularly to do with the track twist because the the bogey is or the the vehicle has got wheel at each corner. Um, yes, it's got some flexibility in it. But if the track is twisted, it can't necessarily take that up perfectly. So you get one wheel, diagonally opposite wheels, which are more loaded, diagonally opposite wheels, which are less loaded and therefore more likely to derail. And again, rolling stock faults, uneven loading exacerbate that and make it much more likely um, that you will actually get a derailment. And as I said earlier on the flange climb, the wheel climbs when the ratio to lateral is high enough so that the lateral is enough to make it go up and the vertical isn't enough to hold it down. So here's an example. Um, it's a freight train at Lewisham. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with that. Um, it was a caused by rapidly developing track twist immediately after um, a renewal. And it was a very complex renewal through some very complicated switch and crossing work, um, which had a lot of this, the classic problems. Some of the um, tamping, tampers that were delivered didn't work. They got some replacements in. They were short of kit. They didn't manage to do all the jobs that they'd hoped to be able to do. They assessed it and said it was fit for traffic on the basis of the evidence that they had. But unfortunately, it wasn't fit for traffic. And um, very soon after it was opened, this happened. Um, so what went wrong? Um, They didn't measure the track twist under load on site after the, because they couldn't, they didn't have the equipment to do it. They could only do the static tests. 
and that wasn't good enough. Um, the ballast wasn't as well consolidated as it might have been because they didn't have the equipment that they'd hoped for. And you can understand the pressure to get the job done, the trap reopened, it was an important location. Um, and in this case, um, they have split bearers. And some of the, the, the joins in the, the concrete crossing bearers, it, which went across, I think, at least two tracks, I'm not sure how many, um, had to be in the forefoot. They generally try to put um, the joins in, in long concrete crossing bearers in the six foot, not in the forefoot between the two rails. But in this location, those joints were in the forefoot. And the joints had been redesigned by somebody who thought they'd done a good job, but didn't quite understand the forces that were going through that joint in the crossing bearer. So it didn't actually work quite as they thought it did because they'd misunderstood the job it was trying to do. So the bearer, the tie design wasn't as good as it could have been. Being in the forefoot was bad. The ballast con consolidation underneath wasn't as good as it might have been. Um, and the net result was a mess. <laughs> so what can we do? Um, that, there's a void in that, um, in that little animation over there. I'm sure you're all familiar with voids. Um, so what you see unloaded is not what you get when it's loaded. Um, measure trap twist under load, like measure engage under load. It's easy said, it's not always easy done, but when you have it, please make use of it. Um, and yes, we all know about planning site work. It doesn't always go to plan, but sometimes you need to know what you can and can't do. Um, and in this case, there was a bit of offset loading, but that was, I think, a, a, a minor contributory factor. I think the main problem here was the, the trap renewal and all the issues around that. Right, track buckles. This is one of my favourite pictures. <laughs> I really like that one. Um, that is from the derailment of a passenger train in Cumbria. Um, and that is the train that derailed. <laughs> I was looking at the back of it. You will see it's still standing up. Nobody was injured. It didn't fall over. Um, and it is a classic. It's well worth reading the report. It's a classic communications issue as well as a derailment issue. Um, the preceding train, the driver of the preceding train, felt nothing. Um, the, the other member of staff who was at the back and the passengers in the second of the, of the two vehicles of the multiple unit felt a kick. And it's almost certain the buckle happened under the previous train. That was reported to control as a kick. That got reported to this driver as a bit of a bump. So although he was slowing down to keep an eye out in case there was something that would give him a bit of a bump, he wasn't expecting that. And he could slow down, but he couldn't stop. If the precise words that had been given to control had been passed on as a nasty kick, he might have been going a bit slower. So anyway, so what happens? Um, I've got various things. Um, Steel expands and contracts with temperature. This should not be a surprise to any of us, but sometimes it is. Um, and I wish I could remember his figures. Um, Brian Whitney did a wonderful presentation to the Vehicle Track Interaction Seminar um, last year, I think, where he said, in the winter, our network is X miles long. In the summer, it's Y miles long. <laughs> and he'd worked out over the whole of the, of the network how much it grew. <laughs> and I thought that was a wonderful way of, of putting it. Anyway, um, when you've got jointed rails, the gaps between the joints are there to allow that expansion. When you've got continuous welded rail, obviously it doesn't do that. Um, so it's got one temperature at which there's no longitudinal stress in it. At a higher temperature, it's a compressive stress. At a lower temperature, it's under tension. So getting that rail temperature right, the neutral temperature, is absolutely key. Um, if it's not right, then either it's going to break in the winter because it's being stretched too much, or it's going to buckle in the sun because it's got nowhere else to go. Um, and the rail temperature will be higher than the air temperature because the solar effect on the steel heats it up locally. So the rail temperature can be, and I don't think 18 degrees is an ex, is a, 
is an exaggeration. It can be very significantly higher than the air temperature. So measuring air temperature doesn't tell you what the what the real temperature temperature is. Um, there are some networks where they have large seasonal variations, where they actually restress the rails twice a year in spring and autumn. Hopefully, climate change doesn't get us to where we have to do that because that is a huge exercise. Um, but it is something we have to manage and we have to be aware of. Um, and the temperature in the summer is a lot higher than the temperature in the winter. The neutral temperature has to be chosen and maintained to match those limits. Um, and ballast restraint is a really interesting one. Um, ballast, of course, restrains the sleepers. That's the main thing that stops the sleepers from moving sideways. Um, but it isn't, as most people might think, it isn't the pile of ballast at the sleeper end that does most of the job. That does about a third of the job. The rest of the job is done by the ballast sliding or the sleeper sliding through the ballast. So it's the friction of the sleeper trying to slide over the stones it's sitting on and between the stones either side. So if the ballast bed is low, so you don't have stones along the sides of the sleeper, you've reduced that resistance quite a bit. The bottom surface is important, but the sides and how the ballast is packed in between the sleepers is also relevant. Um, and generally, the actual track movement takes place under a train. Um, Though interestingly, some, some friends of mine who work for um, Austrian railways have recently done a big exercise in trying to work out whether a, the train can actually produce enough force to move the rail sideways, move the track sideways, and it can't. The rail, the, the, the train cannot produce enough lateral force to slide a sleeper through the ballast. So it's just the little bit of disturbance that the train gives that means the rail does what it would have done anyway. It's not being pushed sideways by the train, it's under tension and it wants to ping somewhere and it just pings when the train's there rather than when the train's not because when it's just sitting there, it doesn't mean much to disturb it to make it go. So it tends to happen under the train, but it's not because of the train, if that makes sense. Um, track buckle is a particularly nasty derailment because it tends to happen at line speed. Um, the Cumbria one was an exception because the driver had been warned and was going slowly. Um, so it tends to be at line speed, which means the vehicle travels quite a long distance. It also means the vehicles tend to spread themselves around over the neighbourhood. Um, and this is another one in, in Lincolnshire, uh, where you can see the front of the train down the bottom of that picture. Up at the top is the rest of the train. <laughs> Fortunately, there was nothing on the other track. That's a two-track railway. Um, so. As with one of the others, track buckle isn't a slow speed local. It's higher speed and it will make a mess and other things may well run into that mess if we're unlucky. Um, and therefore, there's a high risk of subsequent collision um, because infringing the clearance on, on uh, neighbouring neighbor lines is very likely. Um, so risk factors, temperature. Talked about temperature enough, I think. Um, so incorrect stress-free temperature, um, tight or seized joints. Um, the upper picture is one from the Cumbria example. Um, it was clear that the rail had been creeping, been gradually moving, and the joints had closed up. Um, they'd also, to get rid of um, some of the, um, the ride problems, they'd also welded up half the joints. So in, instead of um, 60 foot lengths, they got 120 foot lengths of rail. But they didn't increase the gaps when they did it, <laughs> um, which would have been appropriate to increase the increase the gaps. Um, but rail creep, you can see that fish plate is up against the chair, which is not where it where it should be. The whole, the whole thing has been creeping through, um, and and therefore pushing the um, the tension into into certain areas. Um, weak points in the track, the Lincolnshire one. Um, Finally, it went as a place where there used to be some switching, redundant switch and crossing work. And one of the expansion joints was still there. And that was where it finally, no, not expansion joints. Um, it was where the crossing, the switch had been um, so that the support wasn't all it might have been. Um, and it actually went there. Um, lack of ballast, you can see in the bottom picture, the ballast bed is a little bit lower than we would ideally like. Um, voids. 
that reduces the resistance of the sleepers to, to movement. Um, and I think we all know that in, in hot weather, we're not allowed to go out with the tamping machines. And this is why mm. we don't want to disturb the ballast bed when the temperature might be hot, because consolidated ballast gives decent control um, and unconsolidated ballast gives much less good control. Um, so you've seen the two examples. Um, that's the Cummersdale one, which I've talked about. The later train was cautioned, but wasn't going slow enough because the communications didn't say you need to go really slow. It just said keep a bit of a lookout. So that's what the driver did. Um, and at Langworth in Lincolnshire, the front 10 wagons passed over, no problem. Um, and then the next 10 wagons derailed, four of them overturned. And by that time, the, the last two of the train had slowed down because it parted and the last two were still on the rails. That was a mess. Um, and the magnitude of the buckle probably increased as the train passed over, it got worse. So the front of the train got over it and then the rest didn't. Um, that's those two. Right, what's next? I think I said most of this. Um, avoiding track locals, understand what the high risk locations are, think about stress-free temperature, think about rail joints, think about rail creep. All of these things are signs that something's not right. Um, and rail anchors do help to reduce, increase longitudinal resistance and, and reduce that movement. Um, as you will see there, it's quite common in Italy and other places, and it is done here to some extent, to paint the rail web white. That reflects the sunlight off and has an impact on how high the temperature goes. Something like five degrees has been quoted um, as a result of simply white paint on the web. And it works best um, if the track, track is running east-west because then the sun from the south hits the side of the rail. Um, it works less well on the north-south because then it only gets the sun on the side of the rail morning and evening when it's not quite as strong. Um, and that's the uh, that's the temperature graph for not sure which I think that was the Lincolnshire one. You could see it was going up and down, but when it went was the highest temperature of the of the year. Um, it's what happens. Right, dynamic response to track. Um, this is another nasty incident. Um, vehicles respond to track. This is some very poor track and a not very good train. Um, just to demonstrate, we get dynamic response from the vehicle and the track. Um, track geometry has a wide range of wave wavelengths. Some of them are there in the track design, curves, transitions, all of those things, switches and crossings. Then there are variations which come from deterioration. And there can be things that are actually put in by the maintenance machines. Track maintenance machines have their own wavelengths and they do tend to sometimes put stuff in as well as take out stuff. Um, in terms of the maintenance. And the vehicles respond to that, depending on their speed, depending on the wheel rail conditions, equivalent conicity, which I could go into another time, but not now, um, and depending on adhesion, how they respond, if it's wet or dry, high friction, low friction, um, and depending on suspension, design of the suspension and the state of the suspension, and for freight vehicles, depending on the loading. This is another one that comes at higher speed and therefore causes a nasty incident um, and is likely to have severe consequences. And um, as you know from, from other reports, the driver may not be aware that one of the wheel sets or two of the wheel sets further down the train is derailed. The change in drag on the train is negligible. There is nothing to tell the driver that there's any different. It doesn't behave any differently until it falls over and breaks and, and, and stops and the, and the brake pack parts. Until then, the driver is not being ignorant. There is absolutely no information that he's got. Um, he doesn't have wing mirrors. He can't look back and, and see the cloud of dust <laughs> behind him. Um, the driver simply doesn't know. Um, this comes from the derailment to Gloucester and that train ran 10, 15 miles, something like that, derailed. <laughs> Fortunately, nothing was coming the other way and it didn't hit anything. Fortunately, it didn't fall off into the school playground or any of the other things that it passed along the, along the way. Um, but there was nothing the driver could have known. If he'd known, he could have stopped, but he didn't know. And there's no reason why he should. Um, 
The most common in GV is cyclic top. Um, and I'll come back to that on the on the next slide. And you can see it um, on that diagram on the bottom right. That's the, the, the track history trace taken by our AIB afterwards. Um, it's on a bit of a gradient, but you can see there's a sequence of dips, lots of dips, um, all the same spacing. And if the vehicle is running at just the wrong speed, that gets the suspension going. Um, and that's why it's there, because it tends it initially in days gone by, it used to be jointed track, so 60 foot lengths and 18 metres. Um, and we used to get dips at 18 metres and the vehicle would respond to it. We had nine metre wheelbase wagons. They didn't like 18 metre dips. So went um, it's not so much related to um, track joints anymore. And some of it will come onto this on the on the next slide. It's actually put in by the vehicles that then respond to it. So it's self-inflicted. Um, it can be identified by analysis of data from track measuring cars. Network Round have a very good way of doing that. Um, but this is, I'll come back to that, this is the how cyclic top develops. Um, in the case of Gloucester, the initial defect was a drainage problem. And it quite often is something local, like a drainage problem. So there was a dip. So the vehicle sees the dip, it goes into the dip, it comes out, it goes back down again. They all do the same thing. So they put in a second dip a distance further on. All the vehicles, all the container trains on that route were running at the same speed at that location. They all similar vehicles. So every one of them responded to that drainage problem and put in another one and another one and another one. So over time, the vehicles put that damage into the track and then they responded to it. And you can see that very nice diagram from the RAIB report into Gloucester about how it how it develops. And in the picture on the left, you can see the track top measurements from 2010 through to 2013. Those dips had been there a long time. The guys on the ground had tried very hard to fix those dips, but they were steel sleepers and trying to pack by hand under steel sleepers simply doesn't do the job. It's not, you can't do it because you can't get the stones up into the steel sleepers. Um, and they didn't get the tamping run or whatever that would, or the stone blow run that would have done that job robustly. So they, they knew there was an issue, they tried to fix it, but the problem was still there. Um, this is Network Rail's um, measurement of cyclic top. Um, it uses a number of filters, when it sees something at a particular wavelength, it starts counting. If it gets another one, it keeps counting. If it gets a length with nothing, it stops counting. So it counts up when things are happening and it counts down when nothing's happening. Um, you get this a category one, two, category one, ABC, um, as to how bad it is. Um, it's, it works really well. I had an interesting discussion with some colleagues from German Railways DB some years ago um, who has unexplained derailments which we thought might be something like this. So they gave me track geometry measurements without telling me where the problem was. I passed it to one of my colleagues who'd got the, um, the network rail algorithm, ran it through, knew exactly where the problem was, told them where the derailment had been from the track geometry trace. So it worked for, for German track data too. Um, the Dutch have a slightly different way of doing it, which also seems to, seems to work pro rail. Um, so, but that's the trip side of it. From the vehicle side, and you will find this in the Gloucester report, um, that vehicle design was not good um, and it hadn't been tested quite appropriately, quite according to the rules. The damping was inadequate, so it was more inclined to keep bouncing rather than be, be damped away, uh, which is why it was that vehicle that came off rather than any of the others. So again, it was a combination. Um, and the Rolling Stock Standard GMRT 2141 now has a requirement for all new vehicles to demonstrate that they are not susceptible to cyclic top. So you can't just put the onus on the infrastructure manager to get rid of the things on the infrastructure. We have to have vehicles that can cope with what is reasonable to, to find on the ground. So what do we see? Drainage issues are often the starting point. Um, ballast contamination gives an idea that the ballast is, is moving. This is from um, a different event. This is the Marks Tay in Essex. Um, and there were marks 
always after the event when RAIB go out and crawl around and have a look, um, there were marks on the railhead <coughs> indicated that vehicles had been landing on the railhead, dropping back into the fourth foot. And then one day one landed on the railhead and fell off into the sixth foot. Um, but we don't walk the track the way that we used to. It's very difficult to see some of those things. There are other types of response to track. Um, instability is something that people worry about when vehicles are crashing about from, from side to side. Um, it's not actually as dangerous as it sometimes feels unless there's a track fault at the same time, because the Y and the Q, the vertical and the lateral are going together. So it's rolling onto the wheel that might derail and then onto the other one. Um, it's comfort issue, it's a maintenance issue for the rolling stock and for the, for the infrastructure. Um, cyclic lateral alignment is also possible that if you've got unsteady behaviour, you can put that again, put that into the track. There have been, to my knowledge, two documented cases of unstable vehicles actually managing to shift the track sideways but it's, it's very rare, it does happen. Um, and cyclic cross level or, or twist, that's a particular problem in the North American freight car where they have, um, they have jointed track and they offset the joints. So the joints in one rail are out of phase, out of step with the joints in the other. So they get what they call freight car rock and roll. So it's into the dip on one side, then the other, then the other, then the other. Um, but their vehicles are designed to cope with it. Three piece bogey is very good at, at coping with that because that's what it sees. Um, final, overturning. Um, not overturning from wind. We do have overturning from wind. It's not very common here. Um, this is overturning from over speed. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with cant and cant deficiency, and I've touched on it earlier. Um, the cant on the track can only be right for one speed for the curve. So if you're going slower than that, you've got too much count, count excess. If you're going faster than that, you've got not enough count, count deficiency. And a count deficiency, um, the vehicle is leaning in. Sorry, the vehicle is leaning out. Count deficiency, the, the vehicle is leaning out. Um, and there is a maximum count deficiency for the infrastructure, um, which for the majority of our trains is 150 millimetres. If you're going at enhanced permissible speed with a tilting train, it's higher. Um, but there is also, in our standards, a maximum count deficiency for the vehicle, which is nothing that you would expect it to see in real life, but it's a maximum value that it must not overturn below. So down at the bottom, um, if we look at passenger vehicles in GMRT 2141, the maximum in service for most is 150 millimetres, six degrees. But it's a requirement of the vehicle design that they must be able to tolerate 450 degrees, 50 millimetres, 18 degrees, three times as much before all the wheels along one side unload. That's not quite the same as overturning because the centre of gravity is still in the middle, it's not gone over, but it's well on the way. That is a, it's a calculation, it's not a, 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 not a test, um, though there were some tests done at Dover in the 1970s to prove what sort of speed you have to go to overturn. Um, so that's a safety margin and we need that safety margin um, and I did a couple of examples. So this is speed in kilometres an hour on the bottom and cant deficiency up the side and I did two cases. So a 250 metre radius curve with 150 mil of installed cant and a 350 metre radius curve with 100 mil of installed cant, both I think fairly typical combinations. Um, and what that shows you is if the design speed in each case is 80 kilometres an hour, 50 miles an hour, you need to go about double that to overturn. It's not out of the question to be able to go that fast on some of those curves. The trains will be capable of doing that. And yes, we have TPWSS overspeed, but as we know, it doesn't always capture the things it needs to capture. Um, I haven't got it in here, but I'm sure you're all aware of the, the two incidents at Peterborough in the last couple of years, um, where with the best of intentions, it was possible to cheat the system. No intention to cheat the system. No driver would ever would ever do that. Um, so TPWS overspeed does not catch everything. It can't. It's only one of the slices of the Swiss cheese 
and we have to have the others. Um, so the most common are a mistake in the train location or a mistake in understanding which road, which route the train is on. Misreading a speed indication, not slowing down where it should do, braking too late. Um, so what can we do? Automatic speed control, yeah, okay. Um, but that's, <laughs> the cost of that is, is huge. Everywhere, probably not. At some locations, that's a little bit more realistic. Um, and what are they? Well, we have TPWS overspeed, at locations of significant speed reduction already, um, but it's not perfect. Some examples. Morpeth, that's, that's down in the annals of history, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There were three derailment, overspeed derailments at Morpeth, 1969, 84 and 94. Um, the 94 one was because they put on the controls in one direction, but not the other, because the other the incidents had happened in, I can't remember, the up or the down, but they got the controls on one line, but not on the other. Um, the one in Spain, I'm sure we were, many of us will have been aware of that um, in 2013. And more recently, which is the one I want to look at, um, the Croydon tram here in 2016. Um, and there you can see the route that the tram was meant to take, and that's where it ended up lying on its side. Um, it's easy to blame the driver, and it's very interesting that the driver um, is no longer under suspicion on this one. It's the company who's been fined, not the individual. Um, and we'll, we'll come to we'll come to that. Um, these are again pictures from the RAIB report. So that's the driver's eye view in daylight. But bear in mind, this was early in the morning. It was dark. It was raining heavily. There was no automatic speed control, no assistance to the driver, no in-cab signaling. The permitted speed on the approach was 80 kilometres an hour. The curve radius was 30 metres and the speed around the curve was 20. The braking distance from 80 to 20 is more than 180 metres. That in the distance there was the speed sign that told him he had to be down at 20. There's no way you can see that from 180 metres. It's, it's a useless piece of signage. Um, it's not telling the driver anything, certainly not in the dark. Um, and it, it was, for, for more detail, look at the, the RAID report. But um, as you look at that, it looks like the track goes straight on. That's because it used to. This was an old railway and they made a junction off it from both directions into Croydon Town Centre. So the straight on doesn't exist anymore. It's only the two bits coming around and going up into, into Croydon that do. Um, and it was through a sequence of, of tunnels and the driver had to know exactly where they were in order to break 180 metres before the sign that he couldn't see. Um, it's not it's not good human factors. It really is not good human factors. Um, so the various recommendations came out of that, um, a lot of which have been picked up, obviously, um, and some of it by the Light Rail Safety and Standards Board, who picked up a lot of these things. And a lot of these things are now happening. Um, but it is interesting that the driver was not held responsible in the end. Initially, he made a mistake. Yes, he made a mistake. That's that's fact. Um, but he was set up to make a mistake. Somebody was going to make that mistake at some point. Um, so finally, a little bit about accident investigation. Um, and this is what RAIB was set up to do. Um, in earlier years, when I was working for British Rail Research, we used to do derailment investigations. Um, so I have written off a, a lot of, signed off a lot of de derailment reports over my years. Um, learning from operational experience is really important. And there's all these examples of incidents which have given rise to a lot of the things we now take for granted as safety controls. Um, right the way through from Harrow in 1952, etc. Um, and through Network Rail, T-Bay, after Nervic, you could add many more to, to that list. They're all things that we've learned from. And we've learned from other people's experience as well, outside of this country. We don't just have to learn from our own. Um, and a, there's a few key things about accident investigation. This is what RARB does. It's what some of my colleagues train the, the train operators in, in how to do incident investigation. Independent, objective, um, look at the facts, all of those things. So RAIB is 
independent. Um, and the techniques that they use are just the same as anybody else would use. Objective, factual, look at the information, don't jump to conclusions, and then try to find the information that fits it. It's a classic joke um, that you can always tell the track engineer at the derailment site because he's the one looking at the vehicles. And the vehicles engineer is staring at the track because they are each trying to find a reason to blame the other. And that was exactly the same in British Rail days. It's nothing to do with privatisation and contracts. Um, it's natural human tendency to try and find somebody else who was responsible for this, not me. Um, so they look at all of those things. Um, and I think those are very good guiding principles for all of us investigating any sort of, of incident, whether it's a derailment or, or not. Try and find out what happened and why and how we can be, do better next time. Um, and what we find is that in almost all cases, these incidents are not the result of one thing. They are combinations of things and any one of them not happening the incident wouldn't have happened. So it's a safe system, but just sometimes too many things all aren't quite as they should be at the same time. So combinations generally come to create a dangerous event. So that's what I've been through. Hopefully that was interesting and informative. Um, and there's plenty more information on the RAIB um, website if, if you're interested. So thank you. Okay. Well, there's obviously the opportunity to ask some questions, not to have a view or stand whatever. I will drink my cold tea. There was um, one question that was on here, but unfortunately, if you raised it, had to go. So he okay. left a message. So. I, th I think you you may have covered it. He actually said, what was the best way to manage cant when trains have to accelerate or de-accelerate through a curve, e.g. away from or approaching a platform? But he asked that before you actually went into the cant section. So, so if you want to comment on that. Or... Well, there are requirements for rate of change of cant with distance, so that's twist. And there are also requirements on rate of change of cant with time which is therefore also related to the train speed. A faster train will go up the transition quicker than a slower train. Um, and those are absolute and they're, they're not negotiable. Um, but keeping below them and a little bit below them is, is good practice. Um, but th there are requirements in the in the network rail doors and in and the railway group standards for designing those. But I think my, my key point would be don't design for a train speed that just isn't realistic. <laughs> And if you've got a train service where everything stops somewhere and nothing ever goes through except possibly freight, which wouldn't be going at full line speed, um, don't design the count for it, please. But that may be a difficult thing to do. Respond to that. Way back in the late 60s, I think, <laughs> it was um, a train, a track going into Margate Station. The, the track going into the Margate Station had a speed restriction sign. Coming out of Margate Station, there wasn't a speed restriction sign because everything stopped at Margate. Didn't, so it didn't need it, did it? Except one day, a pensioner special <laughs> went straight through Margate, no speed restriction sign, takes all the door handles off, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a gauging issue, that's another issue, but yes. <laughs> but the thing is, he didn't have a speed restriction no, absolutely. sign. Absolutely. Um, because everything stopped at Margate, except this pension of special. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting example. Malcolm. Uh, can I make a comment and, and, a, and a question? Um, first of all, on, on the business of um, uh, keeping the cant very low on sharp curves. Quite right about things like the, like the check train and so on. But Dr. Sin Sin Su did some considerable um, research for network rail and came up to the conclusion, and it was written too, <laughs> that you are far better not putting any cant on, on very sharp curves. Uh, and the train will, in fact, uh, even with faults in the track and probably faults in the, uh, um, in, in the vehicles in themselves, it will travel around there at much less risk 
without putting any cunt on at all. And I think probably from my experience, that is the best way of doing it. Not cunt it for 30 miles an hour when nothing goes around it at that speed. And when it did, it would come off the road, probably. But it's not going to overturn. No, it's not going to overturn. You have to go a lot, a lot faster, not, not Absolutely. more too fast yeah. to actually manage to overturn. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad I agree with Sin Sin. I would not want to wish wish to disagree with her. <laughs> oh no, but the, the what, what the, uh, the the sort of analysis that she did and the the amount of um, uh, places she looked at, places like Syston North Curve and these yeah. places, yeah. Um, and she was taking them where there was already cant applied, and people would not have thought about taking the cant off. Yeah. Um, but they were having serious uh, rail defects, yeah. going, particularly side cutting and so on. Yeah. Simply, and also serious lipping on the high rail, was all the weight was going down onto the low rail. Um, so I, the yeah. work that she did, I think, That's really was worthwhile. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Most people now would not have on it. Those yeah. things, those That's things. very helpful. The, the other comment that I would make, it's something that uh, two or three of my colleagues of mine are looking at at the moment. You've mentioned about um, the dynamic loading and recognising it from truck inspection um, trains and so on. In my view, or in our view, there is no substitute for in certain places, you have to watch the reaction between trains and the track, on the track. Things like you mentioned about um, um, chair screws shearing. You can see the effect of that off the train recording, but to find out what it is and what's happening with it, so that you see what's actually happening, you've got to watch it, and particularly an s &C. It really is important. Um, I mean, I had a case many years ago on the West Coast Main Line with SHC fastenings, where the hoop holding the tensioning clip um, had started to come loose on a particular curve um, in the Blizworth area. Uh, it was reported by the patrolman. He said, I think I'm watching movement in that. I've never seen this before. Come and have a look at it. So we did, and there was roughly half a mile of it Literally, we had, well, we, we, apart from putting a restriction on, we actually had to close that for a short time mm -hmm. to get some uh, time on and this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but that, it is important that people who know what they're looking at, and that might be the problem, um, is to go and see what's happening. With and the trains. ability to get trackside when trains are running is very restricted these days. Yes. Um, and, and yes, we understand the safety, the safety controls. They need to be in place. Yeah. We shouldn't be putting people at risk. Um, but not being able to observe it was one of the issues at Gloucester. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the trap folk help, hoped that they'd fixed it, but there was nowhere they could stand to watch the trains go through to see whether what they'd done had been effective. So we make, we need to make sure so, that there is a place so, where you can Something the, that, that needs to be to be thought about. I don't know whether the PWI is some an organisation that could be maybe thinking about that. I'm not sure. Um, but it is a it is an important question, I think, taking the, all of the safety safety rules, of course. Uh, we don't want to put people at risk. Okay. Well, hang on. We'll, we'll, um, Rodney, first, you, did you have a point? Well, as Malcolm said, uh, some, an issue we're talking about at the moment, because it seems that staff are no longer allowed to walk or work on a live railway. But um, I actually had the... Uh, the experience of watching the derailment occur. Um, it was, uh, perhaps to my shame, the th fourth time a derailment had occurred at a particular point. It was on the um, Staines branch, or the West Drayton branch, as we ran to Congre. And uh, the, it was a, a regular stone train working nearly every day. I think there was about 20 wagons. I'm going back, what, 30 years now, so memory's not that good. But, um, we had three derailments, and the first conclusion was that it was pretty well the same wagon, like the 10th or the 11th, it was coming off the road each time. One occasion was serious when it landed up on the relief lines, the other side of West Drain Station, but fortunately nothing was coming the other way. Anyway, I went to have a look and discovered there is another cause of derailments, which you haven't mentioned, and that's what I tend to call driver jerk. Mm -hmm. Because what was happening 
there was a slight twist. The ballast was easing away by the side of a, an underbridge. And the tenth wagon situated above this twist, as the driver opened up mm -hmm. from, from the station, he had to, had to stop short yep. of the main line. The tenth wagon was going, and it was flying off the rail. Mm -hmm. So well, it used to happen with it, those scuppered trains a lot. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Fairly easy after that to say, well, it's my fault. <laughs> but you were probably contributory factor, but you were no issue. All I remember yeah. I was on holiday. Every time I came back, Rodney put it all back together again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Life is interesting out on the track for those that who will stay on the train. Yeah. So there was a, a question from the chap behind Rodney. Sorry, I don't know your name. Barry. Um, uh, you were talking about loading of wagons and how they were unevenly loaded. I was wondering what kind of wagons they were. Were they container wagons or were they um, uh, aggregate wagons? We've we've looked at a lot, um, and it was one of the things that ORR pointed the finger at the industry a few years ago, probably six, seven years ago now, saying um, particularly container wagons at that stage. Um, and it came out in a number of RAIB reports, which ORR then then picked up. <coughs> But the load in the container was offset either to one end or to one side or both. Um, and although the all up weight of a container is very heavily controlled by the shipping people, if the container doesn't weigh what the container is supposed to weigh, you're, the shippers in serious trouble. They're not interested in the load distribution because on a ship, it doesn't matter. It matters what the box weighs in terms of where they put it to get the, the ship balanced. It doesn't matter where the load is within the box. Um, and the vast majority of the loading kit that the freight operators have got can't tell that. It can tell the all that weight, but it can't tell the distribution. Um, so we've now put a requirement on new rolling stock to be able to tolerate a certain amount of offset load for containers and swap bodies. So that was containers. Um, and I've got a few more minutes, haven't I? Um, oh. The other thing we found that was very interesting was the worst offenders for containers were actually um, containers are measured in feet, 20 foot and 40 foot yeah. lengths, um, because that's what the shipping people still use. Um, the worst offenders were, were the 20 foot containers where they could put a heavy 20 foot on a wagon with a lighter 40 foot, because the wagons are 60 foot. Um, and in order to stop the vandals opening the doors, they were putting doors to middle. So the doors on the two containers were butting up to each other in the middle, so the vandals couldn't get on and open the doors. What that meant was because the heavy load in the 20 foot was at the end, the bottom end, because most of it was um, electric, old electrical machines and things like that for export, big stuff that they tip the box up on end, put the thing in, put it back down on its feet, put it on the wagon. Um, <coughs> it meant the load was over the, over the end of the wagon. So the other end was not very well loaded. So we did a risk assessment. So if you put the box on the other way round, so that the heavy bit is more to the middle of the wagon, you reduce the derailment risk very significantly. You have a small risk of your neighbourhood bundle opening the door, but the consequences of that are a lot less significant because there's nothing in there they can nick. Um, and the door is not very likely to hit a passenger train. So the freight operators actually change their loading. But where they took those 20 foot containers, they turned them round. That reduced the risk significantly. Um, hopper wagons and um, tipler aggregate wagons are other issues. Um, most of, some of those are loaded with grabs, so arms, and then it's very difficult to, to know where the, where the load is. Um, some of them are done from an overhead um, drop thing, so they know how much is in each, each bit of a in each wagon, but not necessarily how well loaded it is. Um, what most of the locators have now got is a camera. Um, no, if you're not under the overhead wires, you can do a selfie stick job and, and see what you've what you've got in there. If you're under the wires, that's not a good move. Um, and we've now issued guidance with the help of the freight community um, that says, if the load looks like this, that's brilliant. If it looks like this and it's that much off, it's OK. If it looks like this and it's more off, it's not OK to give them visuals of how offset actually matters. 
Um, you've got to give the folk doing the, the loading a chance. Mm -hmm. um, how are they supposed to know what is or isn't acceptable? Uh, so there's some quite, quite good guidance that's been issued to the freight, freight loaders, mostly for aggregate. Got a couple of questions from home. So there's Felix Schmidt here who was saying about... <laughs> <laughs> Did I say something funny? Um, <laughs> talking about the Elizabeth line, uh, Felix, do you want to make a point live? Put your microphone on and speak. Well, I was just suggesting that um, the canting problem uh, on the Elizabeth line is very exciting because uh, you accelerate at a high rate out of stations and then you go straight into curves. So the front of the train needs one type of cant and the back would yeah. prefer another one. So uh, that has got implications for operations. Yeah, that was fine. just a comment. Yeah, thank you. Yes, that's, uh, that's, quite, that's quite right. And it's not only the Elizabeth line, you get the um, the same thing pulling out to Pancras Low Level, for example. It's quite a, quite a curve at the end of the speed of the front of the train is very different from the speed of the back of a, of a 12 car. Mm. <laughs> OK, well, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. I'm not quite sure why. No, no, the, 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 the folks who don't know is Felix, my husband. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I have no idea. It's a family business. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, and there was another one from Bob Hazel. Um, do you want to put your microphone and ask your question? Yes, thank you. A, a great presentation um, and, and great to see all the work you've been doing over the years. Uh, do you have a view why hot axle box detectors have been allowed to not report the heat of wheels at the interface with the rails when a vehicle is sliding and the wheels are locked, even though the, the hot axle box detector system actually records the temperature? Um, I, I'm not directly involved. I can give a few comments. Um, some hot axle box detectors do also look at the wheel. It's a different line of sight, so it's not the same temperature monitor. Um, and the difficulty is to distinguish between a wheel that's got a problem and a wheel that's just braking normally, because wheels get quite hot when the brakes are on. Um, and I think it was a difficult balance between so many false alarms that you would actually discredit the whole system and occasionally missing something that might otherwise have been picked up. And I suspect it's something that needs more work on how to tell the real ones from the false alarms. So it may not be in the sensor, it may be in the algorithm of looking at it. Um, that, that, that's what I've picked up from conversations. It's not something I'm directly involved in. No, I as, as I understand it, it was discontinued back in sort of early 2000s, the rail track um, early top FOC times. And, and uh, you're right, as I understand it as well, it's because of false alarms. But I would have thought in the last 20 years, we developed the technology, computer technology, to identify the variance in uh, temperatures in one or two particular wheel sets compared to the rest of the train. And no, uh, there's been a few the, nasty derailments of late where yeah, it, it could the, well have been classic. prevented. Um, and it may be something that is that is worth looking at again, um, but it would probably need to be done on a whole train basis rather than on a, a single wheel basis. Look at if a wheel set was out of sync with the rest of the train, for example. Um, but yeah, that might be something worth thinking about. OK, we'll go back to the room now. We've got a couple who have been desperate to ask Sir David, go on, go on, and then I'll come back I, after that. I've, I've been modifying my question as I went along, because <laughs> excellent question so far. Now, I'm a bit of an outsider, so this is a bit of a philosophical question. But um, from your very uh, thorough and articulate presentation, thank you very much, we, you've outlined all the problem areas. Uh, in theory, it would be possible to design and maintain a railway network to the void of these trouble spots. Um, but to do so, it seems, apart from limits on resources and limits to human nature and so forth, there would have to be three or possibly four things taken care of. Number one, you have to gather the information that would tell you that what was going on. Number two, you have to get it to where it's needed and quickly enough. Number three, Something has to be done as a result. 
And number four, you need somebody watching over this to make sure that the other three are not falling asleep. <laughs> so is it, can we make things actually any better? And if so, if so, which of those areas would give the best yield? That's an interesting and a very helpful way of looking at it. Um, as we are at the moment, we are generally drowning in data. We have far too much data. Mm. What we're not very good at is the second stage, which is actually digesting it and coming up with something that somebody can do something about on the basis of that data. So I think that's that's a really important. And that applies to the rolling stock side as well as to the infrastructure mm. side. Um, it's very easy to gather data. It's not quite so easy to gather the right data and to analyse it in the right way to enable it to be useful. Um, and it's very easy after the event to go back and say, well, I told you so. It's all there in your data, but there was so much data. Um, yeah. So I think the second one is really important. Um, and the one that you've partially not got, I think, is a trade off um, between how much it would cost to prevent any of these things ever happening versus what we are prepared to tolerate um, in terms of risk and in terms of cost. That's a very difficult discussion that we often end up having. And I, I, I alluded to the question about the containers. Um, and that, that was a genuine question. We are increasing the risk of a vandal opening the door on the container. Is that acceptable if we're decreasing a different risk? And those discussions are not always easy to have. There was another one that I remember from some years ago in my, shortly after I joined RSSB, um, which was the question of sanding and sand upsetting track circuits. Signal engineers hate sand because the track circuits don't work as well. Rolling stock engineers like sand because it helps the trains to stop. Um, but again, it was a robust safety analysis that said the risk of losing a train on sequential track circuits so that you actually get a collision is actually a lot less than the risk of not stopping so that you get a collision. So sometimes there's a trade-off, we can't do everything. And we, we need to use our data in an intelligent way to say, where should we be putting our effort? Not putting our effort into the wrong thing, is that the sort of fourth or fifth thing on your on your chain? If we do this trade-off calculation before instance or only after instance. We try to do it before, but you need a certain amount of knowing what question to ask before you can answer it. We were very, very good at investigations and reports and inquiries in this picture. It's been good. I wonder why. We actually have a lot fewer incidents than yeah. most railways. This is a very safe railway. We, we shouldn't forget that. Yes, I've been talking about things that have gone wrong, but it's a very central way. Mm -hmm. Very well. <laughs> they, sorry, you've been trying to get a really question for ages. You're not going to have a poll the comments about going on the truck side. Sorry, you look at the track. Uh, OK. Um, just simply to say that um, what we've managed that this can be very, very much reduced to people on the track. Most of the risks are going to be more imagined by the people who have never been on the track, who make the health and safety decisions and so on. Yeah. Um, that's all. That's the, you know, okay. The people ought to be allowed to explain what can be done. So, uh, thanks again, Bridget, uh, for reminding me of all the things I've been told in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure really the practice in some of which is for any other mishap uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, I'm not directly being involved with managing real infrastructure for um, uh, 15 plus years. Uh, and, um, you know, we're at a stake in this country, the amount of investment, whether it's new things or renewal and so on, is at a high level. We are computer literate and can measure a load of stuff. Um, I think everybody who works in the industry is computer literate. I couldn't have said that 20 years ago. Yeah. So where are we? I mean, you say we're a safe railway, but we haven't less demands. I mean, the sources of derailment wouldn't. Well, I say Brunel probably might not have seen cyclic top, but all the rest of them uh, probably befell his uh, brand new railway hundred years ago or so. So where are we? We that's great steady improvement. 
steady improvement if you look back over 20, 30 years. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because if you contrast that, you know, that to desperate times, the, the, the heads of the uh, rail track, they got the, the whizzy guys, I can't remember the names from Canada, and we went from the middle class, front of the class, and the broken rails in this country just yeah. Yeah. down from a yeah. thousand to yeah. 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 barely a hundred in, yeah. in the space of two or three years. Yeah. Um, but I know the Romans are so more complex because it's uh, multiple factors. And uh, but there, there are some knotty problems that still need resolving. Yeah. Um, I mean, going, going to the, the rail failure, um, Brian Whitney again would tell you that one of the, and, and my colleagues and the same experience, would tell you one of the issues at the moment is um, fatigue with is rust and, and corrosion from the base of the rail. Inspection from the head of the rail is very good. Most of the brakes are actually coming from the bottom now, not from the top because we've dealt with it coming from the top, it's much harder to see what's going on at the bottom. So there are some things that we still need to, to try and pick up. Um, I think that some of the um, cyclic top track deterioration type things, we should be using making more use of drones, for example. No, the, the drone can watch the train go past. <laughs> And it can give you some really quite good pictures of, of what's happening to those those fastenings as the train goes past, if you know where to look. But you can't do it everywhere. So if you've got a problem area, we should be thinking about how else can we do it? If it's too difficult to get a person there, can a person go somewhere else, stand on the bridge and put the drone down, have a have a look? The cameras on those things are amazing, what, what yeah. they can see. So we shouldn't dismiss some of these other, other technologies to help us find a way around but you do need to know what to look for um, and there's i've also seen seen reports of um the possibility of using satellite imagery um to see movements of embankments mm -hmm. because they're sufficiently detailed that if you do the clever computer analysis um cuttings or embankments you can see where there's actually been any any movement and you can you can track is that just you know um, expansion and contraction with water content or is it something a bit out of the ordinary so all of these things are actually possible in a slightly different way from what we're traditionally been been thinking about um, so yeah there are there are still plenty of new ideas to to develop um, some of them are far-fetched and some of them are perfectly practical okay um where are we at? OK, Louis. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm involved in a lot of low adhesion research and um, it's always interesting to hear when high friction can actually lead to greater safety problems on the railway as well. So the question is really, are you aware of any um, derailments where the derailment mechanism has been directly the result of railhead contamination as opposed to indirectly the result? There's a lot of incidents, Salisbury comes to mind, where that did end up being a derailment as a result of a low adhesion incident being the root cause that led to the whole that led to the collision, which yeah, factors. the collision led to the derailment. Of course. Um, Generally, yeah. no, low adhesion doesn't lead to derailment, mm -hmm. but it will lead to not stopping and hitting things, yeah. <laughs> which then leads <laughs> to other, other problems. You know, generally, derailment in the sense of sliding off the rails or pushing the rails apart, that requires higher forces, and you yeah. don't get the higher forces when the no. Well, you right. way, way back in history again, I started on the railway very early on. Um, steam locos, high speed steam locos, used to create a bow wave ahead of the train. Mm -hmm. What would that lifting? It's less on, on diesels because you haven't got the hammer blows and all the rest of it increasing this accident. Up. But on steam locos, there was a bell wave mm -hmm. where the track lifted in front yep. of the train. Yep. Um, because it's, you know, in our, our steam days, mm -hmm. it was about two inches. <laughs> what would that effect of that bell wave lifting the track ahead of the train? Um, follow through on the ability of the ballast to ret retain its grip of the sleeper yeah, 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 yeah. or the rest of it. Um, 
There is still a lifting effect, um, yeah. inevitably. I mean, yeah, as I say. You, you will have seen the, the algorithms for how you distribute an axle load over three or five sleepers yeah. or whatever. So it, there's a there's a bit that goes down but because the rail doesn't come up and go flat. It comes up and there is a bit of a, a, a bit of a lift in front of and behind each bogey, generally, rather than in between the wheel sets of the bogey. Yeah. It's still there. It's not, it's not going away. Um, there was even a discussion some years ago about trains going faster and could they run into their own wake? Um, and it, it's, it's not entirely a stupid question, but you would need extremely soft ground for that to become realistic. Um, so that's not a problem. Um, what the Austrians did was um, they realised that if you want to shift, if you want the, if the vehicle is going to shift the sleeper, it's only going to shift it when the wheel's there. So it, the track buckle might be encouraged by the track being lifted a bit in front of or behind where it's loaded. Yeah. But there's no force to push it sideways. <laughs> so unless it's got the yeah, temperature it's effect. Resistance when it comes back down again. It generally comes oh, back. If it doesn't go up far enough, it comes back exactly where it, where it went up from. And all the stones around it are still where they were. Yeah. It doesn't shift anything else because it's just a bit. It's not the two inches you were you were talking about. It's rather less than that. Well, it used to, used to be about two inches. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> okay, is there anyone with one last question, or can we? Uh... Okay, oh, I shall uh, call it there, Bridget. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mick, could I ask you to do the vote of thanks? <clears throat> you can ask to. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Richard, uh, thank you very, very much for, for what's been an incredibly uh, informative and enjoyable um, uh, thought, and especially as you got us out of a serious period, as, as probably um, people uh, realise this was, Bridget's done this at the very last minute, so it's, it's a fantastic talk. At such short notice, and thank you very, very much. It's it's actually been um, really absent. I mean, it's been an excellent talk, I thought, because uh, this is a, a, an annual event in PWI and um, Mickey Rail. Um, every year we meet here at, uh, just after New Year in, in Reading. Uh, and thank you very much. And uh, the, the talks we try and get um, something that's of interest. To, to both institutions. I cannot think of anything more <laughs> appropriate from what you've just done, Bridget. Thank you very much. Absolutely um, a, a, a demonstration of, of why we need each other. <laughs> that, that's, that's absolutely, that's, thank you very, very, very much. Um, uh, several things that I, I took note of that sort of are, are worth um, looking at in you know, it's just simple things, actually, that it's almost throwaway lines. Like, if a track component breaks, it's broken for a reason. That's such a simple thing. But yeah, it's not true. Yeah. How many of us have just, have, over the years, just replaced something, whether that be a track component or a suspension bolt or whatever? Again, it's equally true for uh, for, for vehicle and, and track. And I so recognise what you were saying about... Um, on derailments, the uh, track engineer looks at the way vehicle. The, uh, <laughs> I've spent many an hour looking at the track trying to find out why my vehicle is derailed. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's it's always uh, it's, it's always a result of a combination of factors. Absolutely, can't part we know that. Um, so thank you very very much. Uh, I, I can think of nothing more to say other than it was fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Well, that just leads me to say we apologise for the very cramped conditions in this room. I think that's the best we can do. We just can't get a bigger room at the cost that we get this for, which is obviously doesn't cost us anything. I did look at other places in Reading, but for two hours in an evening, it's best part of 600 pounds. So um, I think suffering a little bit of discomfort just to get everyone in to listen to such a good presentation is a, a small price to pay. So apologies for that. Thank you for turning up in great numbers. Well done to the IMEC-E.
You outnumber the PWI. Well done. <laughs> Showing from the PWI, um, I, I haven't been able to analyse who's listening online. We we can fight about it for years. Thank you, thank you for those at home for tuning in and taking part. Um, it really leads me, Richard. Next meeting, please. Next meeting. Oh. Well, going from the horrors of dry rails and dry wheels, <laughs> our next meeting is about flare lubricants uh, and the rail industry. So, um, Franz Pienaar, one of the um, you know, top people from flare lubricants down in Kent, is coming to tell us all about how to make things slide. And his name is just showing okay. up on the screen here. So, oh, good. He's listening to <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows. Thank you, Franz. You've committed. <laughs> anything else? No, nothing else, really. Nick? Uh, our next uh, meeting is Monday the 19th of February. It's our annual um, young members presentation called Future of Rail. Um, each year around about this time I panic uh, and this year I am panicking. Uh, we have as yet no confirmed um, participants. This is generally the case and somehow it just sort of drops into place. I've had two expressions of interest and and no confirmations yet. So um, I the employees, um, if you could bully your young members, please. Uh, and uh, so that's the, the next presentation is the 9th of February. Uh, and after that, the next one, the one after that is the 13th of March, which is actually at Southampton University. So that's the university event we should get. Um, anybody that can manage to get to Southampton, it really is a worthwhile attempt. Yeah. OK, excellent. Well, that just leads me to say thank you once again to Bridget. Thank you to everyone for being here and thank you to everyone at home, wherever you may be, for tuning in. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.